Hello, FPP listeners. This is Michael Rosso, Film Photography Podcast, March 15th, 2024. Today on the show, we're going to be talking about movie film. If you've never shot movie film, it's going to be a really lively conversation with myself and Matt Mirage. And then later in the show, we're going to be joined by Owen McCafferty. And the subjects are movie films. We'll be right back. Tonight, we've asked Harriet to tell us something about her own personal movie camera. Yes, it's called the Kodak Medallion 8. I like it because it's easy to carry, it's very good looking, and it's easy to use. Now, I'm no expert, but watch. To load it, you drop in the film and click it shut. See? And it makes wonderful movies. We've taken lots of movies of David and Ricky over the years. It's a movie record of our family, and it's one of the nicest things we own. Buy your wife a medallion aid of her own. It's ideal to borrow for fishing, camping, football. Well, in between, I enjoy my medallion very much. I think you will, too. See the Medallion 8 movie camera at your Kodak dealers. It's only $11 down. And also see the three-lens medallion turret model. They're made by Kodak, so you know they're good. Hey, we're back. Here with Matt Marash. Hey, how's it going, guys? And we're talking about we're talking about film in motion. It's pretty wild how much it's changed in the last few months, Mike. Yeah. Now, now you're not the only person at the table rooting for it. <laughs> exactly. Today we're talking about 16 millimeter film, the new FPP, 16 millimeter black and white three film. Now, historically, what FPP has done since its inception is we mine existing film stocks that have different purposes and were never used in camera. And why is that? Why were they never used in camera? They're used for lab applications. When I say lab, I mean film laboratory applications. So, for example, Black and White 3 is actually a chromiogenic, which means color, Mm -hmm. a color lab print film that has never been used on the camera. Meaning, in a lab, it's being contact printed with a negative. Oh, okay. So to get the finished print. Yes. Okay. So it is a print film that's being, that in our purposes of our experiments, of our tests, we tested it and said, oh my God, this is a stunning, tight, tight grained, fine, fine grain, panchromatic black and white film. Now, because it's a lab film, it's an ISO of three, which don't gasp. Uh, It may seem like an unmanageable ISO. But if you're shooting motion picture film at 16 frames per second or 24 frames per second, that gives you fixed shutter speeds Mm -hmm. of 16 frames per second. Your shutter is approximately 1 30th of a second. And 24 frames per second, your shutter speed is uh, 1 48th of a second. But let's call it a day and call it 1 50th of a second. So in your light meter, you're setting the the ISO 3. You're you're taking your light uh, reading... And then you're seeing, most light meters have a cine line, mm-hmm. cine bar. Yep. And there'll be a little indicator that says 24 or 16. Oh, okay. No, so I just, I mathed it out. So if someone's using uh, black and white three, for yes. example, uh, this is definitely going to be something you're shooting in super bright light, daylight preferred. Daylight, yes, daylight. So let's say sunny 16, right? Sunny 16 says bright sunlight, you set your aperture to 16, and your shutter speed is one over your film speed. Well... You're, we're working with a fixed shutter speed in yeah. terms of cine. So let's say we're doing 24 frames a second. That's 1 50th of a second is your nearest. If we go from 1 50th down to 1 3rd, we're going to be opening up about 5 f-stops. So we go 16, 11, 8. So 11, 8, 5, 6, 4. You're shooting like f4, f2.8 to f4 in bright yep. sunlight. So this is all math. So if you have a Gauss and Luna Pro meter or, or any meter that has cine, now look at uh, one forty eighth of a second. It's right below right one fifty. See the little little line. Mm-hmm. It's straight twenty four. Oh, and there's even a little dot where twenty four matches up, so you know exactly where it's yes. metering for. Oh, great! This th- getting your f stop is not as scary as folks as you may think it is. It, if you have a meter, most meters have this cine function, mm-hmm. and o- now all you're doing is lining up your your arrows. You're, you're like, okay, I'm mm-hmm. shooting one thirtieth of a second. Oh, look at that. Right above, right below it, it says uh, 16 frames per second, mm-hmm. and then and right above that will be your f-stop. 
Beautiful. Yeah. Easy enough. But, you know, really, realistically, any of these lower, more experimental type, you know, in-camera uses, bright sunlight's going to be the way to go, unless you're on set with somebody that has a right. ton of light that's in use. But really, some high wattage lights, direct yeah. sun. This is not an indoor film. No. Why and usage? Well, why is because the film is much less expensive. How much less? A uh, hundred foot roll is currently thirty nine ninety nine. Oh wow, it's like half the price of other black and white. Yeah, so it's inexpensive and it's giving you a very unique look for your cinematography, and it's something very different. And a lot of FPP customers have been testing this and checking it out. Uh, two things. People love the look of the film. And, by the way, when I recommend the Gosson Luna Pro F light meter, there's never been uh, a person I recommended to who didn't have that meter become a lifer for them. It's kind of like what you grew, grew up on when it comes to light meters. Mm-hmm. Like, I grew up on this meter, but a lot of folks in film school, they, they know the Sakonic or Same. they use yeah. a spot meter. or they use mm-hmm. All these meters are great. So I'm not saying one meter is better than the other. They all, As long as they get the job done and they're accurate... Mm-hmm. Great. And even if you have a meter that doesn't have Cine, you can always take your frame rate, double that, and that closest shutter speed to that is what you can set it. So 24, you set it to 1 over 50 is your yep. your shutter speed, and you can just go from there. On the light meter apps, you're dialing in your shutter speed. So you, if you're shooting 16 frames per second, you dial in 1 30th of a second, and you dial in your ISO, mm-hmm. take your meter reading, and then voila. That's it. That's it. So that's it. The first that test roll that I shot with my, my Airy all those months ago, a little strudel walking. I had some FPP black and white 100, but in order to get that really like that neat, even look, uh, even end of the day, I remember I was using an ND4 and I was using an orange filter to get some extra contrast in this. I could have just loaded that straight up and I would have shot it the same way. Bring down the ISO? Well, I was trying to shoot with like not f16 because i had 100 speed film in the camera so like a lot of people think oh 100 is what i need for daylight but on some of these cameras you could be uh, f11 f16 if it's direct sunlight yes absolutely this this could be like if you like shooting close to wide open but you like shooting outside this is a great solution it is and you're right folks always think you know this is a, a common thread here at the fpp folks are always thinking better is the speedier Mm-hmm. High high ISO. Oh, let me grab the 400. Like, no way. Y- you're right. In broad daylight with a Cine camera, 100 ISO, you walk in the line of being like... Too much. Too yeah. much and having to use NDs to knock down your F-stops. I'm always running NDs, so this, this is a great solution. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, thanks. Look at all the features that come together only in the Minolta 110 Zoom SLR, all for less than you might think. A zoom lens with close-up setting. Snap-in 110 cartridge loading. Through the lens, viewing and focusing. Automatic exposure for point, focus, shoot, simplicity. Get it all together in the Minolta 110 Zoom SLR. Hey, we're back. And this is a very important segment because these are motion picture film cameras that, you know, the big X. You cannot use them. And Mr. Owen McCafferty is going to tell us why you should take these cameras and make them shelf queens. A shelf queen is a camera that you put, well, on your shelf. People come in, they see it on the shelf, like, ooh, that must be worth a lot of money. Hey, hey, can you get film for that? Yeah. (laughs) In the background, we have Matt and Leslie. The ooh and ah, or ooh. Yeah, who, who are you to tell me what I can and cannot shoot? Exactly. Shut your mouth. <laughs> Owen McCaffrey's going to take the segment. Go. So these are. This is not to be like. This is not like a poo poo for buying these cameras. This is. These are cameras that people write in um, to me and they go, "Hey, Owen, I just got this camera. What kind of film can I get for it? How, do, how does it work?" And then I have to like, like write that dreaded response to be like, oh man, you know. It's usually somebody who's just getting into, into this. And that's like the worst thing you want to do for a first impression. Say no. Is yeah. to say no or yeah. to give like a, a a negative response. So hopefully you can avoid these cameras. This is by no means an exhaustive list. I literally made this list going through my inbox. So these are actually cameras that people have written to me and asked about that I had to say no. So this is not an exhaustive list. And I would say, if you're listening and there's cameras you'd like to add to this list, please, owen at filmphotographyproject.com, because I'd love to continue expanding on this, just so people get a heads up. You know, you're on eBay, you're at the thrift store, 
you see this camera and you know which one to avoid. So first on the list, and, and I would say, and, and these are in order of frequency, how frequently people ask me. Number one on the list. Number is, one! <laughs> which is a shame because these were the best, in my opinion, the best consumer Super 8 cameras that Kodak ever made. And it's the Kodak XL line of Super 8 movie cameras. These are the ones that look like binoculars. They were meant, they came out for the one, Ektachrome 160. That's mm-hmm. when these were released. They were XL mm. means existing light. And they were great movie cameras. Unfortunately, they suffer from a bad gear. And I wrote a blog about this a number of years ago called Grinding Gears. There is a worm gear inside this camera that was made with an inferior plastic material. Every single one of these cameras, every single one, I don't care whether it has never been opened, I don't care if it's never had batteries in it, every single one will fail. You'll put batteries in, you'll put the cartridge in, you'll run it for about a minute, and then it literally disintegrates into dust. Has anybody tried to 3D print a new gear? I'm glad that you asked. So there is a a regular listener, his name is Jim Schulman, and Jim has, and he's been actually doing this for another camera, which I'm going to talk about next, is trying to find somebody, uh, like a gear cutter, who could could figure it out. The problem is... When you find these gears, because of the plastic loses its moisture, it shrinks. Oh, so okay. we're ha- we're having a problem trying to get the original requirements. And as anybody knows, you try to get a, cut a gear, it's got to be exact. It has to be, yeah. I think a number of people try to reach out to Kodak to try to get the original spec. Anybody out there has a contact at Kodak that knows where this spec you know, part spec uh, documents are at, please, Owen at filmphotographyproject.com. Just like that, that Leslie is flashing me. So, <laughs> flashing me a piece of paper. <laughs> it's not that kind of show, folks. Um, so, so, avoid these cameras. They're not going to work. Uh, you know, it, it sucks, but that, that is the way that it is. And I'm going to say that about the next one, which is the Kodak Electric 8 Automatic and Electric 8 Automatic Zoom. Suffers from the same problem. Really? This was a camera... This, again, one of the best regular eight cameras, I think, that Kodak made, at least in the 1960s. It was. Uh, it, it came with its own proprietary uh, magazine that you could load yourself. I mean, just a, a great camera. There's, it, when you read the Kodak literature from this time period, like that camera's on every page. Um, but again, it suffers from the same problem. Um, all of them are broken. They're, they're very expensive. They're way too expensive on eBay. Yeah. You, uh, they're a dollar because again, you you cannot use them. <laughs> not on eBay, they're not. <laughs> so, um, the next one, which is somewhat, you know, and I don't know if these cameras suffer from the same worm gear problem, but I have never found one that works, and that's all of the Kodak Ektasound Super Eight mm-hmm. cameras. I remember that camera. I, I I've had multiple of them. I've never had had them work. They work for a, a few feet, and then I'm assuming it's the same issue, but. It could be something else, because I, I, I don't know exactly what the story is there. But those are the Kodak uh, movie cameras that have a microphone either attached or has a microphone port. Bell & Howell Director Series Regular 8 cameras, and the reason I say this is these are these are regular 8mm cameras. The later ones, especially the ones with the CDSL, the meter, um, the internal meter is suspended in like a spring casing. And there's glue that keeps the meter spring in this casing. And I'm not using the right words. but the, And what happens is that glue deteriorates. The magnet then slips on one end. And I've never been able to figure out how to fix it. So those are, those are ones I really just wouldn't recommend. Which is, again, which is unfortunate because otherwise they're great cameras. Yes, 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 Michael. Leslie Lazenby, Bell & Howell. Director series camera, which she's gifted me, that that where the meter works. Yes. Does that have prob- another problem? That one is okay, but I would not be surprised. Yes. I wouldn't be shocked that when you drove back to New Jersey after hitting a few potholes, if that that doesn't that doesn't break. What's going to break in it exactly? It's it's, it's hard to say, show you without dissecting it, but it, it, the meter has a needle like this, you know, a needle, oh. and that needle, the housing, it's suspended on like a magnet and a spring. And there's glue that holds that magnet in the housing, and that glue dry rots. The magnet slips, and it's no longer suspended. And the way you n- can tell is if you point the meter at something, yes, and the needle doesn't move. Is, is, so it's not working now. It's not working. It's not the selenium cell. 
it's the the physical meter, the the spring, and the way that it's suspended. Um, we breaks. we get a sizable number of emails from people who have direct to series cameras. Yeah. Yep. Oh, you do. It's That's, a very popular camera. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bell and Howell two hundred E E. This is a sixteen millimeter magazine camera. Uh, this, is, which is interesting, this was the very first, very fir- world's first fully automatic sixteen millimeter movie camera. In other words. The camera would adjust your uh, aperture automatically. The battery, the, oh. that battery that's in your Yashica there, I forget what size battery that is. Um, in the Nikon. In, in, sorry, in the Nikromat, yeah. Um, Nikorex, I mean. Turn, what's the name? What's that battery? PX? 14. 14. So this camera had five of those. You would Whoa. install five of them. This is a very handsome camera you're talking about. The 200 e Yeah. And so it was the first fully automatic movie camera that would adjust the aperture on its own. Unfortunately, it's a selenium cell. I have had six or seven of them. I've, I've had one that's brand new with the original sales receipt, been kept in its case. The, for whatever reason, whoever manufactured this particular cell for a Bell & Howell... So those are the ones that are on... Again, these are just based on emails that I've received in the last year or two. Yes, please, Michael. Uh, now, getting back to the Bell & Howell 200EE... Yeah, yeah. I've had folks that have that as well because mm-hmm. the FPP offers the magazine 16 right. film. So now you could use it now, and I should, I should say, maybe not avoid it. You could because you can override it. Oh, you can. You can manual so settings. You can, but a lot of people buy it, like I did originally, two or three years ago, because I wanted an automatic right. magazine camera. But okay, very good. There you good go. To know. So th- those are the ones that are on my list. Again, it's not exhaustive. This was purely based on people who have written into me and asked. I would say, in addition to this, here's what you need to look out for. Be ca- we mentioned this on a segment previously. Be careful of selenium cell cameras with no manual override. Make sure your selenium cell works. If it doesn't, look for, look for a different camera. For uh, the other ones, I would say this is one that I've come across a couple times. People have written in asking me for a referral to repair are the Bolex B, C, and P ranges of 8mm movie cameras. Now, these are great cameras, and if you find one for a really good deal, I say buy it, but they almost all of them, the motor, the wind-up motor, needs to be taken apart and re-greased and repacked. It's, yeah, CLA, exactly. Yes, we have a few at the FPP, mm-hmm. and they will not run. Right, but, the C, but they're extremely fixable if you know what you're doing. So the reason I say it's not not to be avo- not to avoid but be cautious. You have to figure in the cost of that CLA. If you're going to be paying three hundred bucks for one of these Bolex P series cameras, you know a, a good CLA on one of these cameras is going to run you two two fifty. So you know be careful of how much you pay. But great cameras if you're willing to get them CLA. Okay, and for folks who have the Selenium light meter with no manual override, what's the best way to? How, how for novice? How, how to test? How do you, how how do you test? know? If your camera, if your camera with the selenium cell has a uh, a window that tells you the f stop, then it's easy peasy. You take a reliable handheld meter or the the meter app on your smartphone, and you just point your camera at a subject, point your reliable meter at a subject, and see if they line up. If your selenium cell camera doesn't have f stop, like this Kodak Zoom 8, 8 millimeter camera, has a selenium meter, but no, like I can't see what the f-stops are. There's no indicator, it, nothing? It just, well, it just tells me if it's under or over. Oh, that's good. That's good, but if I'm trying to see if it's accurate, how do I know that, that it, you know, you're not going to know if, if you can't tell what the f-stop is, because you're not going to be able to look on your um, handheld meter and, and see and, and be able to compare the reading. So um, I would say if it doesn't, you know, I avoid selenium cell if you can. Really, I mean, there are so many more options in regular eight, especially for uh, you know manual uh, adjustable uh, movie cameras. So, if you have others that you you think I should add to the list, please reach out. I'd love to love to hear about them. But yeah, there you go. Hopefully that that helps some people. Thank you very much. And the reach out is podcast at filmphotographyproject dot com. Or if you're like, listen, man, I want to talk to Owen. Is it Owen at filmphotographyproject.com? That's me. That's me. Or send a telex to... <laughs> si- no. A fax. Or a fax. <laughs> hey, Matt. Hey. Does uh, Midwest love a fax machine up and running? No. 
<laughs> oh, come on. Who has a, do you know anyone that has a fax machine besides a deli? Bank. Bank? I have Most one. banks have them. You have a fax machine? I have it set up on my computer. I mean, it goes through my computer, but yeah. Ah, okay. No not, stand- a, not a phone line. Okay. But, it, but I mean, you could fax me. Up uh, until Staples left Finley, you could still fax at Staples. And it, I, when I was a real estate agent in Manhattan in 26, I mean, half of my deals had to be faxed in. Ah. Uh, I mean, real estate, real estate, or um, as I'm sure you know, Mike, living in an apartment or you live in a condo. Condo. Like, Management companies are like twenty years behind everybody else. Yes. So. Thank you, Owen. Any, you know, Mike. Any time. For you, anything. For, well, maybe not anything. When the neighbors drop by for a slideshow, it's fun for everyone. But what's the answer when you want to run off both regular size slides and oversized slides? The answer is the new Anscomatic. The A-plus slide projector from Ensco. It's the world's only fully automatic projector to take all popular slides. Cardboard, glass, metal, and plastic. And when it's time for those big two-and-a-quarter slides, no problem, Anscomatic projects them clear and sharp. And Anscomatic runs itself. Or with the remote control, you can control your slides from anywhere in the room at any speed you choose. At the end of the show, Anscomatic even turns on the light. The new Anscomatic is available at most dealers for just eleven ninety five down. Whether it's color films, black and white films, cameras, or projectors, if it's from Ansco, you know it's A+. Hey, we're back. Hey, I just want to thank you for joining us on this episode of the Film Photography Podcast. We're going to be back very soon with a bonus episode with the Jersey Boys. For those of you who don't know, that's John Fidelli and Mark Dalzell. And we're going to be giving away... We're going to be doing the latest camera giveaway. We're going to be giving away the customized Argus Sparkle Brick. Folks out there who entered to win, I'm sure will want to join in. So look for another episode coming right up. And as always, podcast at filmphotographyproject.com. Love to hear from you. And if you feel like writing, P.O. Box 264, Fairlawn, New Jersey, 07. Four one zero zero seven four one zero to attention film photography podcast. Hey, we'll see you real soon. Real soon. Real soon.